I was actually going to show you the startup of this, but I don't want to waste time. Uh, this is actually a Yaws application uh, using S expressions for generating HTML. But uh, the proportions are off. Sorry about this. I guess it's a widescreen format. Just there we go. Okay, speaker notes. All right. So, as stated, my name is Duncan McGregor. By day, I am an engineering manager at Adroll, and by night, I'm an LFE hacker and community contributor. This talk was originally going to be about uh, a, um, sorry, a rerun of the talk given in San Francisco. Um, and then sort of touching on some of the deployments that you can do with LFE. Some folks are actually using LFE in production. Uh, however, at the airline conference uh, in San Francisco, Robert and I had a fantastic fireside chat, and uh, he was really excited about the things we could be doing in LFE, and we just hashed out a, a massive list of things we wanted to tackle. You know, optimism was everything. We didn't really think we'd actually be able to get to each of these, and we, in fact, did. Um, so, so much has happened in LFE, that, uh, that we figured, hey, let's change this presentation and, and do a, a state of LFE, a Lisp-flavored, let's see if I can get this right, uh, Smorgasbord, close? Okay. <laughs> I apologize. Um, here's what we're going to cover. I'm going to give you a brief introduction, the latest developments uh, in LFE proper, a quick language tour for those unfamiliar with LFE, I'm going to highlight some of the more recent projects that have been done in the community, and I'll share with you evidence that LFE is not, in fact, an island, and then we'll wrap up the session. As you can see, this isn't just a status report on LFE or the code base. Rather, I'm sharing glimpses of the many things happening inside the Erlang micro-community that is LFE. Uh, it's a community that supports Erlang Beam languages directly through its own work and indirectly by encouraging the exploration of other languages and features in our ecosystem. OK. Oops, I think I skipped a section here. There we go. Why Lisp? In this section of the talk, I'm going to talk about some of the basic ref uh, basics, a refresher for those familiar with Lisps, or a gentle crash course for those who have not encountered them before. One of the first questions that's asked of Lisps by people coming from uh, either C-style programming or Python-style programming, that sort of thing, is why? Why a Lisp? Um, this is often what you see as, as the classic example. Um, to avert any possible panic from this, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, but uh, this is actually an excerpt from the Lisp 1.5 manual. Uh, 1962 was when it was published. And uh, as you can probably discern, the code here is defining set operations, where your sets are defined with uh, lists. Um, and to set aside those fears, here is what this looks like now. Um, this is a preview of the typical Lisp code you'll find in this presentation. Um, and if we wanted to provide set, uh, sets that were implemented with lists as opposed to the sets that are available in the uh, airline standard library, uh, this is what the code would look like. Uh, we've got consing, pattern matching uh, in the function heads, the Erlang lists modules being used, lowercase letters, hey, syntax highlighting. Uh, this is not the Lisp of the 1.5 manual. It's a new world. Um, born three years after the death of ENIAC, Lisp has been with us from pretty much the dawn of computing. Uh, due to the hardships of the AI winter, Lisp has weathered some of the greatest social difficulties a language could withstand. Um, Part of its reputation is due to this, the, the severe kickback that, that it received. Due to its dead simple syntax, small number of core forms, homoiconicity, and macro system, one can accomplish such feats as writing a compiler in the morning or a DSL in the afternoon. Uh, but the real reason you'd want to choose a Lisp is that it's the language of the universe. And what we just ignore the last section of that. I, I, Chopped it off, if you're familiar with the comic. OK, you may say, you've talked me into playing with Lisp, but why Lisp and Erlang? You now have easy access to all the power that Lisp brings, combined with the OTP. Uh, but it's more than just that. It's about what you can do with these two together. 
referencing the great work of Garrett here. Uh, Lisp's home iconicity and macro system, coupled with Erlang's fault tolerant and distributed system capabilities, it is the perfect language lab for the multi core, -core world. Turns out, though, we weren't the only ones doing it. During the same time period, um, we had stuff from uh, Haskell uh, to the JVM and, of course, uh, LFE. Uh, everybody was implementing their own Lisp uh, on, on their various language platforms. Uh, Liskel is the one, yeah, in Haskell. Uh, this was the beginning of sort of a renaissance for Lisp. Uh, you find that pretty much every project now, every language has uh, an S-expression uh, variant that they've, they've got pushed out. It's, it's just a simple thing to do. People are just loving it. Um, why Lisp and Erlang? There are subtle reasons for this. <clears throat> Diversity brings new ways of thinking and new discoveries. Increased options for the Erlang VM bring more programmers to the community. You can witness all the things happening with Elixir, Troxo, Erlog, Lural, Concurrent Schemer. I'm not sure how much progress they're making, though. Uh, living by these principles ensures the wider success of the Erlang VM more people benefit from the excellence that is Erlang. All right, so latest developments. We've got lots of stuff here to share. I'll try and get it in. Um, this is what's been happening in LFE. Uh, we now have maps. Uh, this just recently landed. Uh, Robert's working on some of the fine tunings on this, the, the syntax we might be looking at, uh, some of the function definitions for this. We might sneak in some common Lisp forms. Um, it's now possible to define functions and macros in the REPL. This is huge. So one of the things we've had a couple of closures come, uh, closure developers come to us and say, hey, the thing that really sucks about Erlang is that you can't actually you know, define functions uh, and macros in the, in, the, in the REPL. It's not really a REPL. And we've got an answer for this in LFE now. You can. You can do this. Uh, you can do full development, almost full development, li uh, development life cycle uh, in the REPL. And just, we've, we've got plans for, Robert's got some really good, great ideas about spitting code out and uh, generating modules from anything done w within the REPL which would be a super, super cool feature. Um, strings no longer need to be quoted. And that's the single quote that precedes the actual double quoting. Uh, we've got a new uh, syntax that's more familiar for most folks coming from Erlang with a mod colon func. Um, prog1, prog2 from common lisp. Uh, we've got a new fields name uh, macro that makes it much easier to uh, interoperate with uh, Amnesia and define your various fields. We've got the common lisp style multi-line comments. I've just started using that. Um, and we've got improved handling of hurl files. This allows us to do stuff with eUnit now that we couldn't do before. Um, bunch of new uh, example uh, uh, um, codes uh, that we've got in the, in the example directory. Uh, Joe Armstrong's favorite program's in there now, which is a delight to write in LFE. Um, we've got a bunch of new sites, uh, new subdomains, starting to organize things better so that it's not so confusing for newcomers. Um, Ported the uh, programming rules and conventions from Erlang to uh, to LFE. That was a trip. Uh, also, the common list style guide that um, ITA originally worked on, and that when they were acquired by Google, Google now maintains that document. So we've got a, a an LFE version of that. Um, lots of new documentation in progress. Land of Lisp. Somebody's actually working on Land of Lisp and LFE, which would be a, a treat. Um, and there's some nice Java interop stuff we're working on. The um, current work that uh, hasn't landed yet, um, there's some really cool stuff that Robert's doing with scripting. Um, we're looking at eating Golang's lunch here. Um, this will actually make it much easier to use the systems programming language. Um, we've got uh, standard li uh, new stuff for a potential standard library. Uh, we're thinking that it probably is going to land in some form or another. Uh, we'll actually start maintaining some, some library files for LFA. And uh, some really exciting stuff we're, we're poking around with ARJ. Where we might be going, and we'll see. Uh, I really am I'm quite curious to see what we can, uh, what advances we can make with supporting types in LFE. Um, and if we can't get the stuff we would like to see in the in the Beam files, uh, Robert's got some pretty nifty hacks planned, and uh, I might be pushing for those so we can get it sooner than later. Um, again, standard library. We're going to start getting more stuff landed for that. Um, improvements in LFE internals. Robert's been, Robert's been looking at reader macros, maybe. Um, Anything else there? Yes, 1.0, it's, it's imminent any day now. Uh, we're not really waiting on any one thing. It's pretty much when Robert wakes up one morning, flips the coin and it's heads. Um, 
the docs roadmap, uh, the, the thing that I'd like to point out here actually is the cookbook. Um, and I might actually combine the uh, Erlang idioms and cookbook into one so the cookbook would show you what it looks like back and forth. And I might uh, uh, reach out to the Elixir folks and see about doing a three-way in this, in this particular thing. Um, I would like to complete the uh, Java interop documentation because this could be very compelling for bringing new folks on board. And of course, finishing the user guide. Um, there are several projects that, uh, that I'd like to highlight here. I'm going to go over some of them in detail later in the, in the talk, but, um, but uh, and some of them parenthetically that I've noted here. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd like to give you a quick review of LFE itself. And uh, here's what we're going to cover in the review of LFE and a very gentle crash course. That wasn't planned. Um, LFE's origins are humble, but in the best sense of the word. Uh, it was born on Robert's laptop, 2007, and it was initially released, released in uh, 2008. And by the way, in 2007, um, that was actually when Liskell was released too, so the timing on this wasn't, you know, Robert wasn't saying, hey, Clojure's doing this and uh, Haskell's doing this. It was just uh, the alignment of the stars. Everybody was doing it. Uh, the intent was to modify the particular Lisp that he felt like creating to suit the Erlang VM and not vice versa, not just throw a Lisp on top of the Erlang VM. Um, he wanted Erlang with the Lisp syntax. And you may wonder what caused Robert to do such a thing. Uh, I did, and so I asked him. Uh, and here's what he shared. He was curious to see how a Lisp would run and integrate with Erlang. He wanted to explore generating core Erlang. This was a fairly new thing at the time plugging it into the back end of the Erlang compiler. He likes implementing languages. He thought it would be fun to f uh, fun problem to solve, as a solution would be comprised of many different parts of the problem space, and it was quite open-ended. Um, and I kind of want to highlight that, and I'll come back to it a little bit later, but the fact that this was born of, of fun and experimentation is key. Uh, no mutable data, the st standard stuff. I actually took these guys from some of Robert's early slides on LFE. Same types as Erlang, modules and functions, like everything you're used to. Data types. Here's what we look like for numbers. Uh, I don't know if you can see that very well, but uh, there you can see how some of the bases are defined. Uh, atoms and strings. Uh, atoms are, uh, are preceded by a single quote, and if you have spaces inside of them, you can just wrap them in pipes. Here's some example of, the, of lists and various operations on them. We have car and cutter. We also have cutter and all, like all, all the, the combinations that are, uh, you can find in the list piper spec, common list piper spec. Tuple usage, um, pretty standard here. Uh, and you can see we're accessing the Erlang element um, to get to the, the pieces of it. Uh, records, here's how you define a record. And uh, you can see with the set for it, and the make person is an actual uh, macro that is present anytime you define a record. It, in whatever context you're doing that, you then have access to a whole series of macros that, uh, that provide access to the various operations you want to do on them. And so making a person, and then getting that person's name, um, setting the person's age, and you know, all, all the operations you can do on this as defined by the, the fields that are in this uh, particular record and the record name. Uh, oops, sorry about that. Okay, maps, again, just landed. Here's the new map syntax. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, it's probably, good. I think this is the right order. Yeah, we're gonna keep it with the map, um, map first, and then, I'm sorry, uh, keys first and then map. Um, and then here is, this is the one that's going to change. Uh, probably gonna use the same ordering, but uh, maybe offer some aliases. This is from the common lisp. Okay, here's a neat little part that uh, is fairly new, um, and like I mentioned before, it's something I'd like to integrate into a cookbook. And this is a comparison between the uh, Erlang idioms and the LFE. Um, basic pattern matching, no big surprises here. List comprehensions. Um, this one's a little awkward in LFE. I tend not to use it. I tend to use the more functional approach with a, a map. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's available for you should you choose to do it, and then sometimes it'll be easier to translate. Guards, uh, again, similar thing. Uh, very straightforward. Uh, the or else there can be used um, to do the series of, of checks like that. Uh, what else we got here? Consing and function heads. Um, 
Uh, I overlooked this initially. Uh, it's clearly stated in the documentation that Robert has provided, but um, if you can see past my head there, yeah. um, there's the, the consign and the function head. Um, and I've begun using this a great deal. This one was tricky. Um, I've had to do a lot of conversions from, from various airline projects to LFE and uh, getting the, the map, uh, a map, map oh, sorry, record matching in the function heads has been, been fairly uh, anti-intuitive because it doesn't look like airline at all. Uh, you have to use the macros. Uh, but once you do, it's, it's quite easy. Uh, and there you can see, sorry, the, using uh, the literals. Uh, Robert and I have talked about whether we say we use literals or tell people to use the constructor forms, and we're both experimenting with what it looks like in the documentation if we use literals. Receiving messages. This was one of the things that actually initially really won me over to LFE was how clean it was to, to write the message passing bits. And some sample code, now that the idioms are done. Dot product, uh, very elegant implementation. Tail recursive factorial. Sorry, sorry, I'll back up here. Can you see over my head there? Oh, yeah. And uh, partial function application in the REPL. And this is the first part of the Ring benchmark module. This is the one that was taken from the, um, the one that hosts, it's hosted on Debian.org. And there's the second part of it. Pretty standard. And it, it performs almost identically to the, um, the airline one, the pure airline one. So at the risk of leaving dear Mr. Baggins with questions unanswered, and with our whirlwind tour of LFE behind us, we can now highlight some of the interesting work currently going on in the LFE community. And that is, of course, the ring benchmark behind. Okay, these are some of the projects I'd like to cover quickly. Um, there's more, but we didn't have enough time and I'm barely gonna have enough time for these. Uh, the magic word, this was taken from a presentation. That I, I'm not the origina originator of this. I, I did laugh when I saw it though. I'm gonna say it again, Monad. So, the first project, Calrissian, it's brand new. It's inspired by the airline, oh sorry, the Erlando project. Only supports one monad so far, uh, and I haven't actually dove into it, I've just run the example. But there's a couple that I'd like to add to it. Um, uh, it's a project I'd actually wanted to create myself and somebody went ahead and did it uh, in the community, which was fantastic. Uh, they beat me to it. Here's some example usage of it. Um, um, I, I don't know enough about monads to even really talk about it. Um, Here's another example. Um, uh, another community sample that was recently given to us was uh, someone that did an Eli integration with LFE. And this is, apparently I haven't tried Eli at all, but it allows you to run um, a web server and service inside your, uh, inside your project itself. Very cool stuff. I've done a lot of work with Yaws. Um, love Yaws. Uh, it's a granddad that's still cranking out the hits. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of projects that, uh, and actually LFE tool generates a bunch of YAWS uh, projects. And here's an example of a bootstrap YAWS project skeleton, uh, just a single command and bam, you've got your bootstrap project uh, using S expressions like this in your HTML. This is uh, actually from this presentation. This is the index generator for this presentation. Um, lots of links. I've got references in the back of the slides which I'll be publishing. And so all the stuff you have access to from there. LFE tool, t-shirt. Um, this has just been fantastic for generating, uh, very similar to, to Elixir's mix, um, generating projects, uh, installing stuff, one-stop one shopping. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of the details here. We don't have enough time. Uh, oh, that's, yeah. Uh, the co uh, output coloring for the run test runner and cleaning that up to make it actually readable was, uh, was a big thing. That was inspired by a Ruby project. They did something very similar to that. It's pretty nasty hacking of, um, of terminal colors, uh, but it's worth it. Um, this is my new favorite pet project, uh, JLFE. It's fully experimental. We'll be diving into it uh, shortly. 
Um, it's a lot of fun to work on. Uh, I've did, done a little bit of work with Clojure, and so this is uh, it's dear to my heart. And there's uh, some quick sample usage, but again, I'll, I'll be going over this in a, in a few minutes. All right. So this is the next section um, for the smorgasbord. And uh, it's the various ways in which you can uh, uh, interoperate uh, with, with other uh, parts of the, the beam and uh, outside the beam uh, communities. Erlang VM, uh, we're seeing a renaissance. And uh, there's a lot of languages that are working with the Erlang VM. Uh, really good stuff going on here. J interface. Um, that's actually it was a lot easier to work with than I thought it would be. So there's there's really really great stuff we can do. So with Erlang itself, um, it's a no brainer. Uh, this is it really. Uh, you, this is the original syntax was the colon uh, mod func. We've now got the the mod colon func. That's all you need. That's it. That's integration with, uh, with Erlang itself. LFE and Elixir, almost as simple. All you got to do is add it to your, your depths in your rebar config file, and then do your, your make uh, get depths. This is assuming you've created a project with the LFE tool. Uh, make get depths, make compile, and just run it with uh, pointed uh, to the right uh, eBin directory. When you do that, you get dumped into the, uh, the REPL. And, uh, and this is as easy to, as, as it can be. Um, you, in Elixir, you don't have to actually reference Elixir dot. Uh, it does that for you uh, implicitly. Obviously, you have to do that, do that in LFA. So there's a little bit extra typing. But, uh, but yeah, you can use uh, Elixir code seamlessly. And uh, one of the nice modules there, uh, the streaming, stream module, uh, is, is a good example for that. Um, I haven't worked with any of the built-ins that Elixir provides. I don't know what that would be like in LFE. Um, I haven't played with their protocols at all, uh, but these are both things I want to work with and, and check out their Unicode support. This one was fantastic. Okay, so JLFE is totally experimental. It's a wrapper around, um, around Airjang. Um, and when I saw Creston's presentation at the Airline Factory in San Francisco uh, a few months back, um, I said, hey, I'm super excited about this. I want to dive in and, and try some stuff out. And so I did, and made a lot more progress than I thought I would. I thought it was going to be much, much trickier. Uh, just a few, as a single, maybe I guess two patches to, to LFE. Um, one to uh, make up for the fact there's some weird string parsing problems between uh, uh, LFE and uh, Airjang. And the other just basically to get uh, LFE to support syntax that can um, uh, check for a Java form. So I'll go show you some examples of that. Um, there's still some outstanding issues. Um, constructors can be tricky uh, when you pass parameters. Um, uh, yeah, control D when you quit out uh, gives a very crazy trace back. But here, here's some of the, the example code. Um, the top part is just LFE and Airjang directly, um, and you can see the calls you have to make fairly awkward. Um, and so the macro um, change, or actually, uh, I guess it is macro parsing changes made in LFE uh, allow you to shorten that very similar to, similarly to what you would do with Clojure. You don't have to do the full, uh, full path for uh, java.lang calls. Again, uh, calling con uh, this is how you access constants. Um, uh, basically, just uh, it's, you're still doing a call in LFE, uh, even though it's not what you would do in Java, but you just override the behavior and do a couple of checks. And if it doesn't end up being a call, then you can actually do a, a static check and, and then get it in that case. Constructors, um, with, the, with the new syntax, uh, constructors are dead simple. Um, again, you're, you're skipping all the crazy stuff from, from Airjang. Uh, can't use uh, the dot form. It's an illegal character in uh, common lisp and therefore in LFE as well. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we can actually do instance members. Um, we'll see. Some experimentation to come. Uh, but you can make this call right now in, in, uh, in LFE if you want to get it. Types can be a little bit tricky. When you get the types back from Airjang, it's actually a representation of a Java object. It's a proxy. And so you don't actually see a value. 
Uh, so there's a utility function here to actually get values for you, and, and you can actually program like you would an airline. Um, areas to explore, some, all kinds of stuff to do. I'm not going to go over this in detail. LFE enclosure. Uh, so I got that far. It's like, hey, what about actually closure itself? And J interface, of course, is the right answer. And uh, so I created a small project, and I take it back. I ported a project from, from someone else that was an air, airline closure uh, project. It didn't work, uh, so I had to get it working first. Then I ported the airline parts to LFE um, and documented that. And what this project does is it creates two nodes, a one enclosure, one using J interface, and you send messages back and forth, very simple. Uh, but based on that, you can uh, do a whole, a whole series of new things. Uh, anything you would do with J-interface. But it's nice to have some function, actually functioning code up and running that you can try this with. Um, get clone it, make compile, uh, make REPL, dump you right in there, and then you can uh, start the application, just like you'd do with any um, usual uh, OTP app. It's actually making a system call to start up Java uh, in the shell, and so it's a little bit awkward there. Um, I don't know what other options might exist for that, uh, but then you can send your messages to the, the process you just started. And, um, and then when you flush the shell, you can, you can get the responses back. Um, and it's basically, here's the notes on what I had said earlier, message sent back and forth between the nodes, and then you get that uh, response back to the LFE REPL. Um, I would love to do some experiments with uh, number crunching, uh, maybe some machine learning. Um, see what that would look like. Uh, it would be a good practical application for this, um, especially if you've got a diverse environment. At Adderall, we've got uh, Java and uh, an Erlang uh, both being used extensively, and there are very often conflicts in the planning sessions, and this might be able to eliminate some of those. Okay, so here's what we've covered. And uh, before I do the, the full wrap-up, I'd like to tell you more, uh, highlight more about what, uh, what LFE really does give you and why you might want to use it. With just these, you have uh, all sorts of power at your fingertips. Uh, but it goes beyond that. We have access to all the works in the Beam community. And we can fairly easily translate decades worth of Lisp code that is available. And I've done this with several projects uh, that were done at universities for um, hierarchical task networks, um, you know, machine learning type things, artificial intelligence. And we have so many different ways of interoperating with, with you know, other parts of the programming language world, including JVM. And all of this with the best actor model in the market. And the power is mind-blowing when you think about it. But with great power, you have great responsibility. Computing had its beginnings in the darkness of war. Um, ENIAC was built specifically for calculating uh, artillery tra trajectories. Uh, Johnny von Neumann got involved, and it was used uh, almost primarily and mostly on the Manhattan Project itself. Um, and there were various idealistic reasons for that, uh, but it's a fairly terrifying thing to think that this is where we, we have our origins. And here's the, um, the later Spider-Man quote. In contrast to the heaviness, though, this was created to explore intelligence. Erlang was created as a, in a playful manner to explore reliable systems. LFE was created in the same playful spirit that was upheld at Ericsson CSL. So this is a very wonderful contrast to, to where we started with, with programming in general. I found out that actually Voltaire, this is a misquote, he didn't actually say this. Um, I searched through the documents online and could not find evidence despite everybody saying he did. As socially responsible hackers, we need to remember the power of our tools. It's easy to forget in the, in the excitement of the moment and it's also easy to forget when we're frustrated at a job. This is actually a very similar quote. This might be the original source. Um, most, uh, most worthy of power is the one that knows the responsibility. That's the translation. Uh, we've got OTP and Lisp macros. 
we don't need to worry about what's going on with governments and, and what they're going to do with stuff. We can make mind-blowing software that actually helps people. We can rewrite our own history. And I would like to quote uh, Katie here from her talk the other day. In the spirit of using our powers of mind for good, this view perfect, is perfectly stated. It's a wonder exa wonderful example of the high standard to which we need to hold ourselves. I'm just going to read it out loud. I think we should care because we write programs for the whole population, and we should have a fair representation of that population creating these programs. The technology we produce shapes our world and our future, and we want it to be shaped in a way that reflects the interests of all, not just an empowered few. And that's, that's it perfectly. And that's, again, why I emphasized how LFE was created. It was with that spirit of, of fun and play, of exploration. And that's what drew me to LFE, and that's why, uh, that's why I'm here. So that being said, thank you very much. Here is some contact info, and I can take questions. Mm -hmm. would require some changing in the, in the beam of an abstract machine, but uh, is it something that you consider? Oh, we've actually got LETREC, right? LETREC's for functions. The substitution can create local use and recursive functions, yes. Not okay, but not data structures. You can create your own recursive lambda structures. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. But for data structures? wouldn't know about that stuff. <laughs> um, I haven't actually played with the Elixir protocols. We don't have an implementation of protocols like, like closures, but um, I'm fairly curious about that. I have a friend who just, uh, um, they just got their first round of funding in a startup, and it's a closure startup, and they have had huge success with using protocols to um, ship features in record time. And so I'm, I'm curious now that I've got a real, real nice case, case study to base that on. Anything else? Yeah, I can't remember how the module system worked in the Comlis. Right. Uh, is the module system still a flat namespace as an error? Exactly. Yeah. No. Absolutely no changes, no, no monkeying around. Yeah. Robert specifically did not want to do anything crazy with that. Okay. Yeah. Which I actually was fairly dismayed at originally because. Um, I've become a pretty big fan of ASDF and all the package management and Common Lisp, and uh, I got over it. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thanks again, folks. <laughs>